want to start with the, setting a bit the scene for the DAW Europe lecture and starting with a quote that Christine Lagarde used on the 5th of October last year when she spoke, spoke at the uh, John F. Kennedy School. Um, and it's a quote from John F. Kennedy, 1962, um, who, who said, the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. And then you went on and talked a bit about the global economy and, and the risks and the need for reform. But if you take a look at Europe, uh, this quote is probably much more urgent and much more important that for Europe today than for most other regions in the world. Um, and if you look at the economic performance, the Euro-area economy is recovering. Mario Draghi last week said it's the best economic recovery since the introduction of the Euro um, almost 20 years ago. Um, so the Euro area seems to be recovering. But if you look deeper, you see the fault lines and the conflicts that we have in Europe. Um, and I would summarize them under three Ps, populism, uh, protectionism, and paralysis, or lack of reform. And if you look at populism, of course, we see that in different parts of the world, but we also see it very, very strongly in Europe. We see uh, the Brexit decision. Um, we see the polarization uh, in the elections, the political polarization in elections in France, in Italy now, but also in Germany. And this populism often is not about issues. It's really about polarizing. It's really about conflicting groups one against the other. And in Europe, it has a very strong anti-European and anti-Euro dimension. So also in this country, the, off, the feeling is often what is good for Europe is not necessarily good for us nationally uh, here in Germany. The fear that often Germany is abused as a transfer or in a transfer union as a paymaster for others in Europe. So there's this deep mistrust and this strong nationalism which really has led to a clash uh, between European nations um, and very much against uh, the European integration and in particular also the Euro. We see it in the second P, the protectionism. Um, clearly this is the most visible with Donald Trump now imposing tariffs on steel and aluminium, um, I, at least temporarily exempting Europe. Uh, but you see it in many, many other dimensions, not just on trade, but you see it in terms of taxation, that there is now a danger that we will have a race to the bottom with a big tax reform in the US, with many Europeans saying we are going to do something similar. Um, and also we see it in Germany. Uh, we have this huge current account surplus, and we are very proud to export 260 billion euros more every year than we import, and do not realize that this is also partly the result of protectionism, not because we are exporting too much, but because many sectors, and particularly services sectors, are overregulated, overprotected, which means there is less investment. We have really a big problem of private and public investment in Germany, leading to less imports and therefore to a huge current account surplus. So protectionism is not just an issue that affects one country, but we see it pretty much in all countries with a very strong nationalist uh, element. And the third one on paralysis, on lack of reform, including lack of uh, economic, but also political reform. Uh, and again, here uh, we see that, of course, countries need to do reforms, and a lot of Europe, southern European countries have done very tough reforms, have done a lot. Um, actually, it's more Germany that hasn't done many economic reforms over the past 10 years. But in particular, it also concerns Europe. Um, and uh, if you, coming back to the quote of uh, uh, repairing the roof, we see that we have fundamental weaknesses, so huge uh, gap in the roof uh, in Europe uh, what con concerning the, in the, archi the architecture, the institutional architecture of the euro. We, we know we have moved ahead with a common currency, but have not done enough on uh, coordinating fiscal policies, coordinating structural policies, making sure you have all these elements in place that will ensure the success of the euro. So this fits very nicely into uh, this series of the DIW Europe lecture. It's the fourth lecture that uh, Christine Lagarde will deliver today. The first was Larry Summers, the second Mario Draghi, the third Barry Eichengreen. So we're very happy um, that um, uh, Christine Lagarde will today address the Euro area architecture in her speech. I want to uh, say a few words about uh, the trade-offs and of course when we talk about European architecture uh, they have very very different views across countries in Germany we like to emphasize national sovereignty uh, in other countries they talk more about solidarity that we need more solidarity to make the euro work uh, in Germany we like to emphasize rules in other countries it's more 
flexibility, adjusting to what is needed to be done. Uh, there's focus on risk reduction in other countries, more on risk sharing. Um, there is the idea of crisis prevention versus crisis resolution. So you see all these different focus or different foci um, in the international discussion with Germany often on the one side. And I think the important point really, for me at least, to underline is that these are not opposites that contradict one another, but they really are complements. Um, to have effective national sovereignty over economic uh, or social or political decisions, you also need to have solidarity in Europe. So these are not opposites, but it's a way of bringing them together in a smart way um, in a reform of the architecture of the Euro area, and we will be very curious to hear from Christine Lagarde. I want to say a few words uh, of introduction about Christine Lagarde. <coughs> I think she does know <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, I think she needs no, no long introduction. I think we all know who she is, the 11th managing director of the IMF. Um, she is a French citizen uh, and also a European. Uh, she is a, um, by, a lawyer by training, but has also worked in uh, institutions where economists are um, more f uh, frequent or more dominant. Um, she has lived and worked in France, equally in the United States. She was the uh, uh, chairwoman of the Global Executive Committee of the biggest law firm in the world, Baker and McKenzie, in Chicago. In 2005, she became the Minister of Trade in France. Uh, then after a short stint as the Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, she became, 2007, uh, the first female finance minister uh, of France, which uh, position which she held till 2011, uh, and then uh, became the IMF Managing Director. She is a uh, has played an extraordinarily important and successful role at the IMF. Um, she is a great communicator that, who has really managed to rebuild trust and confidence, not just in the IMF as an institution, but also helped really build that trust and confidence in Europe. And we have seen the bickering, the infighting um, over rescue programs for Greece or for other countries in, the, in recent years. So she has taken over the IMF in extraordinarily difficult times and has managed to steer the institution and make the institution uh, adjust to the challenges uh, that are faced. Um, she has uh, provided remarkable uh, successful stewardship of the global economy, uh, advising governments what to do. Um, and in that role, uh, um, the IMF has played an incredibly important and successful role. So successful that now in Europe, some people think of transforming the ESM, the European Stabilization Mechanism, into an EMF, a European Monetary Fund, because you also would like to have something like the IMF in Europe. Um, and um, the fact that whenever there is a crisis and a program, also the German government says, no, we need to have the IMF on board. The IMF is the only institution in the world that has the expertise needed to help steer countries through difficult economic and financial times. I think is a testament to the important role the IMF is playing and the stewardship um, Christine Lagarde has provided. So we're very, very happy uh, to uh, have this fourth DAW Europe lecture. We thank you very, very much, uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, and uh, please join me in welcoming Madame Lagarde. Thank you. Marcel, thank you so much. I felt like, you know, staying over there and uh, having you continue this wonderful list of compliments about the IMF and about me. But I guess I have to come up here and uh, say good Morgen to all of you. Good morning, bonjour, Monsieur le Ministre, uh, Mesdames et Messieurs. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in Berlin, actually, um, especially on a relatively sunny day. <laughs> to be fair, I arrived last night. And late last night was a beautiful day in Berlin. And uh, clearly we're seeing signs of spring. Now to pick up words of one of the illustrious predecessors before me, I'm not going to talk about the green shoots. But there might be signs of spring. And that's probably a good backing for the conversation we're having this morning. As we are launching, announcement here, our new IMF staff research on the Euro area architecture. It's online as I speak now, 
and it will be available to any of you interested in the depth and the modelization and all the background to some of the themes that I'm going to try to uh, explore this morning. So, as Marcel has just indicated, we're seeing growth on a global basis at the moment. We're forecasting 3.9% this year, 3.9% next year, and in the uh, Euro uh, area, the IMF is projecting growth at 2.2% in 2018. And that means that the expansion is entering its fifth year, and we believe that the recovery has finally turned into a sustained, broad-based, shared upswing of a cyclical nature, though. So that is quite pleasant, but we're also seeing some headwinds that are quite threatening. You've mentioned some of them under the P's, and I would agree with you that the rise of populism as we see it, and the short-sighted siren call of protectionism are ones that we should guard against. And we need to find guides in the choppy waters now facing so many parts of the world. My aspiration is that the Euro area could be one of those guides going forward. A more unified Euro area can be a compass to prosperity for the region and a beacon of light and hope for the world. It can be a source of global economic stability and the proof that international cooperation between nations can actually work. Just two numbers to keep in mind to realize the potential of the euro area. Measured by GDP, the euro area has the same economic power as China. Measured by population, the euro area is slightly larger than the United States. And while the European project more broadly has come a long way, it is only half finished. Even those who started it actually acknowledged that. From better migration policies to a common defense system to sustainable energy sharing, the, misses, the missing pieces are clear to see, but obviously complicated to resolve. Now, I'm not going to venture in those areas. I'm only going to focus on an area that the IMF is competent and knowledgeable about, and I'm going to actually focus on three particular ones having to do with the Euro area architecture. Because for the European region, and more specifically the Euro area, to be an effective compass, it cannot only be a union for convenient times when there is no tempest, when there is no storm. It needs to be strong enough to shield its members against those storms. So this morning I would like to offer the IMF contribution to the conversation uh, that is beginning as to where the euro area might travel next and ways the currency union can fortify itself for challenges ahead. And to begin with, I think it's absolutely necessary and fair to acknowledge the progress that has been made. If you had told someone immediately after the Great Depression, not recession, depression, or right after the Second World War, that 19 European nations would be trading in the same single currency and would try to solve issues with a common united front, they would have thought, that's a fantasy. But through cooperation, through hard work, and with the courage of, the, of those who built it, it has actually happened. The IMF has been a partner in this project, from our support to the Maastricht Treaty to helping new members join the euro and adopt it as a currency. And there is no doubt that the work has been difficult at times, sometimes painstaking. And the system that was created, as I said, had gaps to begin with, and those were left unaddressed because there were good times in those days. But those gaps became abundantly clear during the back-to-back -back blows of the global financial crisis and the euro area sovereign debt crisis. Do you remember 10 years ago? No, no, I'm not talking about the Lehman Brothers. That was in September. March 2008, the 16th. 
Those of you in the banking business or in finance would remember. When Bear Stearns actually collapsed, of course, afterwards, we had Lehman, Bro Lehman Brothers and a few others. But in the years that followed, both the capacity and the limitations of the euro area were tested. And it is during that period that the Europeans created new institutions and new capabilities. Think of the establishment of, finally, the European Stability Mechanism. Think of the unprecedented support that was delivered by member countries to Euro area counterparts. Between 2010 and 2016, no less than 250 billion euros in loans were granted to five countries hit hardest by the crisis. During the same period, the European Central Bank showed considerable commitment and leadership with its whatever it takes, allegedly under the mandate, to preserve the currency union. And these actions, these new institutions, actually kept the currency union together and helped pave the way for recovery. But to this day, there are still limitations. Actions were taken to address crisis legacies, and much remains to be done, from building up resilience to securing the financial sector to ensuring the fiscal policy places. We know that there are still weaknesses in the system. And now, thank you, Marcel, for picking up my quote from John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Now we believe that as the sun is shining, including in Berlin, we cannot afford to be complacent. And it's time to repair the roof when the sun is shining, as it is time to complete the architecture of the euro area. I was former I'm a former finance minister. And I know how difficult it is when growth picks up, when the coffers are filling up a bit. I know how difficult it is to say there is more work to be done, more reforms to be undertaken. It calls to mind what Jean Monnet once said to Willy Brandt as they debated the creation of a monetary union. And he said, it is not natural for men to unite. It is necessity that pushes them. Now, the reality is that there is necessity in the euro area now. Difficult to decipher possibly, but it is here. It's the necessity of filling in the missing pieces of the architecture so that the region is better prepared for the next crisis. Because sooner or later, and that's, by the way, the job that the IMF has to do, is to anticipate what comes next. And we believe that sooner or later, the next downturn will come and the need for a good compass will quickly become apparent. So there are several areas of reform that should be considered as European countries review the euro area architecture in the coming months. June has been identified as a point in time when reforms will be proposed, good. Let me, on behalf of the IMF, identify three of them today. Probably in ranking order in terms of difficulty and, and timeline. A modernized capital market union, an improved banking union, and a move towards greater fiscal integration, starting with the creation of a central fiscal capacity. And let's be clear, the goal of these reforms is not to encourage complacency, but to create more resiliency in the euro area. To use the technical terms, the union should strike the right balance between risk sharing and risk reduction. But I prefer to think of it as the idea that member states are definitely interconnected. And to work well, the euro area needs more mutual trust across countries and increased accountability. The, go, the two go hand in hand. This progress in tandem, hand in hand, on trust and accountability would enable the union to realize more its potential and become greater than the sum of its parts. Of course, 
it will take time to get there. Let me touch on the capital market union first, probably the, 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 the closest one. We have seen positive steps already. The capital market union, also known as the CMU, its action plan is designed to provide businesses with a wider range of domestic and cross-border finance options. And that would reduce the dependency in which many of the companies, corporates and SMEs, are finding themselves vis-à-vis -vis the banking system in the European Union. We are already seeing momentum in some areas, including recent legislation to improve access to financing for SMEs through high-quality loan securitization. These instruments will now operate on a level playing field with similar types of assets. At the same time, a new prospectus regulation has streamlined administrative procedure and made it easier for smaller companies to raise capital. Firms issuing debt or equity must produce standardized information. This will also allow investors across Europe to have a better sense of their risks. We believe that now there is more urgency about completing this job. Why is that? Because clearly as a result of Brexit, there will be additional sources of financing that will be sought in continental Europe and certainly in the euro area given the hedging procured by the common currency. Enhanced regulation and upgraded oversight arrangements will be needed to handle the potential influx of some of these firms that provide financing. And efforts can go even further to create a fully integrated EU capital market. The Commission is working on it. Proposals of March the 12th are really steps in the right direction, but it has to move fast. Additionally, more transparent bankruptcy rules could make it easier for investors to at least partially recoup losses in case a business fails. Better harmonized insolvency laws and business continuity plans would promote investment between countries. Now, if you allow my take as a, as a reformed lawyer, clearly heading towards a completely harmonized bankruptcy regime is going to take a long time. And I would certainly believe that it is necessary to look at incremental steps in that direction in order to at least procure a minimum common denominator across the countries in order to at least give some assurance and certainty to the creditors and to the holders of securities in particular. Implementing all or even some of these proposals would develop capital markets and stimulate growth for the entire region. Capital union is one thing. Banking union is another step that would complement it and that we believe is very much needed. Why is that? Is it to help the banks? I heard that in the past when we were trying to protect the deposits of depositors. No. It's not to protect the banks, it's to prevent yet another crisis that would expose, yet again, the depositors. Euro area policymakers have made significant progress on this front. The creation of a single supervisor for banks, the introduction of a new framework for handling bank failures, and the development of new tools to address banking crisis are major achievements, no question. However, the lack of a common deposit insurance and a shared fiscal backstop for the single resolution fund could put these gains in jeopardy. In fact, these are the very instruments, these two that I've just mentioned, the common deposit insurance mechanism and the fiscal backstops. They are the very instruments that would stop bank failures from snowballing into financial crisis. Now, why is that? Typically, if a bank goes bust, a country's insurance system can at least partially compensate account holders. But in a crisis, when it's not just one bank which is facing trouble, but many more, the system can be overwhelmed. And this makes it impossible to give people their insured deposit back, unless, as has happened, the government steps in. 
And if the costs are high enough, a sovereign debt problem can arise. Remember Cyprus 2013? Exactly the case. So a common deposit insurance scheme would allow the cost of bank failure in one country to be shared by banks across the euro area. It would reduce the risk of banking sector problems being shouldered by taxpayers and turning into another sovereign debt crisis. And here the size and diversity of the euro area could be key strength. And to make it work, all sides will again need to share both trust and accountability. Significant efforts are already underway. Euro area banks have nearly doubled their capital buffers since 20, 2007. Non-performing loans have been already reduced by about 100 billion euros in the past year alone. And many Euro members have embraced the spirit of the words of former EU Commission President Jacques Delors, who said, the European model is in danger if we obliterate the principle of personal responsibility. But in order to prepare properly for the next downturn, more action is needed. A few ideas worth considering. In return for a common deposit scheme, banks which have high levels of non-performing loans, and there are some despite protestation to the contrary, those banks should commit to aggressively clean up their balance sheets. And we are certainly favorable to the idea of a timeline and a timetable for that. Banks have also the option of continuing to build up capital and ensure that they have the ability to absorb future losses. I'm delighted to see that the June uh, European Council meeting will provide an excellent opportunity to discuss these issues and take the ne next step on the banking union. There's an encouraging sign that the common backstop to the single resolution fund with access to the SME is considered. Uh, agreement on the schedule of, for common deposit insurance together with the roadmap for reducing vulnerabilities in the banking sector would be an even better signal. Additional point, and I will not comment too long about it, but we know that accounting for sovereign debt held by bank is controversial. There are ideas floating around as to how to deal with it. So yes, the path forward is certainly difficult, but the destination is worthwhile. A safer banking system across Europe, one that is self-insured and does not rely essentially on sovereign implied guarantees and does not fall back at the end of the day on taxpayers. But just as we are coupling risk sharing and risk reduction to generate support for the banking union, exactly the same strategy can be used on the fiscal front. Many would agree that during the last crisis, the monetary policy had to do much of the heavy lifting. I don't know what Mario was talking about when he addressed this esteemed audience, but I wouldn't be surprised if he had actually argued that the bank has shouldered too much of it. Raising taxes, cutting spending, as many in the euro area did between 2011 and 2013, in our view, exacerbated weaknesses and contributed to a double-dipped recession. To avoid a painful repeat of this experience, we believe that the euro area needs a central fiscal capacity. This would supplement, not substitute, supplement members' own fiscal efforts, which will always be the first and main line of defense in any downturn. And it is not a matter of some countries altruistically helping others. A central capacity will actually re reinsure, reassure investors that the euro area has better tools to stop the next crisis from spreading. And this will help prevent the near panic that we saw last time around. And benefits actually go beyond crisis prevention. 
the capacity can help smooth out the economic cycle and improve the functioning of the currency union, especially when monetary policy proves insufficient. You don't necessarily have that much space in monetary policy when you've endeavored so much in the last crisis. So this is not a new issue. The IMF has long advocated central fiscal capacity. Today, we're trying to be even more practical, more detailed, more analytical, and we are releasing a paper that actually shows how it could work. And we've explored multiple options. So the proposal that we are publishing upon today actually proposes to create a rainy day fund that countries contribute to each year to build up assets in good times. Then, depending on the depth of the downturn, countries would receive transfers to help them offset budget shortfalls. And in extreme circumstances, in our proposal, the fund would be actually allowed to borrow. However, such borrowings would be repaid by members' future contributions. It seems simple on the face of it when I go through that. If it was that simple, it would have been done. There are political ramifications, there are also quite a few technical issues to be addressed, and we're trying to address those in our publication. Now, by itself, the capacity may not be enough to solve the next crisis, but it certainly would help. By way of illustration, the paper analyzed the case of a large euro area wide shock when monetary policy is constrained, not much space to play with. And it found that for a relatively moder modest cost, only 0.35% of GDP per year for each of the member states, a central fiscal capacity would half the impact of the recession, it would also halve the gap between the most and the least affected country during the downturn, and it would halve the recession that would be imposed on a country-specific shock as well. So down by 50% across the board. Recession down by 50%, gap between the least and the most affected countries reduced by 50%, in the case of a shock against one single country, down by 50% as well. And all of that for a fiscal capacity contribution of 0.35% of GDP. Not a bad bargain, but let's be clear. It would not be a permanent pillow under which you can cover up and do nothing, but it's only a temporary cushion. Our suggested approach requires members to take greater responsibility by putting their house in order. Or as you might say in German, forget my pronunciation, Hagen <laughs> Verantwortung, Uber Neyman. I think it needs a bit of improvement. Some countries are understandably worried that by promising to provide support in bad times, other members will pursue less prudent fiscal policies. And there are also legitimate fears about whether a central capacity would generate permanent transfers from one set of countries to another. Well, our proposal recognizes those risks, perfectly understandable, but tries to offer two, inno innov in two innovative approaches to address these two concerns. First, to make sure that all countries actually meet their obligations, transfers from the fund to the country would be conditional on a member's compliance with EU fiscal rules. And there is a quite subtle um, scheme, if you will, in the paper which realizes what happens in case a country has failed to comply once, twice, three times over the last so many years. 
This requirement of meeting its obligation is actually critical because it creates incentive for all members to play by the same rules, undertake reforms and build buffers. Second, we recommend that countries pay a premium in good times based on the benefit that they receive from the fund in bad times. I'm sure that some of you have had a car accident. And what generally happens when you have a car accident is that your insurance premium the following year goes up a little bit. But that's exactly the same principle. Now, obviously, we recognize that members' views differ significantly on such fiscal capacity that I've just brushed in, in very general terms. The need itself is not universally accepted and it will be politically difficult to reach an agreement. Some actually contend that if the first two steps, capital market union and banking union, are completely done, ah, maybe the central fiscal capacity is not needed. We believe that it is. So very modestly, we trust that policymakers will use these ideas, as well as many others, in their upcoming discussions while keeping in mind the ultimate goal of the proposal, a better mix of fiscal policy and monetary policy working together to enhance the resilience of the euro area and prevent another crisis. And again, we recognize that these topics, if adopted, will of course take time. But we should not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. My hope is that even if it is in small ways, countries can use this moment of global growth to improve the euro area architecture and build a stronger economic union in the days ahead. I began my remark by asking you to think about the euro area as a compass for prosperity, beacon of light and hope for others. Well, you might have thought, what's the problem with a compass? We have a GPS. Don't need a compass. Well, I disagree, which is why we also disagree with those who contend that we don't need a fiscal capacity. We need each and every tool. And I remember the days when we faced this nearly collapse, when we did not have the tools, and when it took nights and nights after nights to actually build up the EFSF, then followed by another one and eventually the ESM. At a moment when multilateralism is being challenged from many corners around the world, many are looking to countries in Europe to show that cooperation can actually translate in deliverables and in economic stability and security. It is not just Monet or Delors whom I have quoted or any other founding father of economic union who might think so. It is this generation who recognizes the power of integration. In a recent poll, 74% of respondents in the euro area said that they support a European economic and monetary union with one single currency, highest number ever recorded. Amongst all European surveys, 71% said the region was a place of stability in a troubled world. Now we need to show them that they are right and we can find ways to improve our ability to navigate those choppy waters. Won't be easy. It will require creativity, compromise, and certainly patience. My message to European friends is that the IMF remains optimistic because we know, just as they do, what can be accomplished when Europeans are united. Europeans can achieve a more resilient, more prosperous Euro area and deliver more opportunities to millions of citizens. We certainly at the IMF look forward to continuing our cooperation with the European Union, with the Euro area partners and its institutions. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very, very much, Christine Lagarde. This was uh, very inspiring. Why don't you call me Christine rather than Christine Lagarde every time? I was trying to If I can call you Marcel. Yes. Okay. Um, I was being very German, so I... Uh, <coughs> um, no, it was an inspiring speech. And uh, you basically said 
look, we need reforms of the euro area. Uh, you pointed out three elements, capital market union, uh, completion of capital market union to improve risk sharing. Um, you talked about banking union, in particular deposit insurance, and you had uh, the issue of the fiscal capacity. Um, now, I want to push you a bit on the timing, um, because um, as you rightly described, the, the um, development of the euro area, the economic development is very positive. And there, because the economy is recovering, unemployment is falling, you hear quite often the argument, look, we don't need to change. So there's a very strong bias towards the status quo. Uh, from a German side, because look, everything is going fine, so why do we need to make reforms? You actually have the opposite argument from, from Italy, um, who are worried about legacy issues, who say whatever change we make, um, it may actually trigger a Deauville effect. So remember 2000, you certainly remember, maybe not all of you, 2010, at the end of 2010, uh, President Sarkozy and uh, Chancellor Merkel came together and said in the future when a country needs help, there should be, we should make sure that, this, that there's PSIs, the private sector involvement, that private investors should share some of the burdens. And this is part of the risk, as you know, in Italy or worry in Italy, that whatever changes we make to the architecture of the euro area, that it might, might actually trigger such an impact. At the same time, we know if there is to be progress on those issues you talked about, the window of opportunity is closing quickly. Right? Next year there will be European elections. So how would you respond to those critics? Why is now the right timing? Why not wait another five years? Um, the economy is doing well. Why not wait another crisis? Or, ah, <laughs> yeah, but these are, I mean, on the German side, the feeling is, look, everything's going fine, we don't necessarily need to do more reforms. And Italy is quite the opposite. They're worried that any reform might actually trigger uh, a run in a very, yeah, um, very care or very um, vulnerable situation with high legacy debt on the sovereign side mm. with what you talked about, the NPLs. Um, I, think, I think your whole question uh, focuses on timing. And that's, that's really... Uh, that's really how you can deal with this, this conundrum of the two diverging views. Uh, one is, we don't need it, uh, and why bother now? Because it's going to trigger um, an, an, another crisis. The issue is, first of all, that of political consensus, and that is going to take a little bit of time, and, but the, the least it should take, the better. But the political consensus should then be about the objective that you pursue at the end of a sequence. Because it's clear that some of the considerations will take time. You don't reduce uh, your non-performing loans stock. I'm not talking about the flux here, flow, um, flow. I'm talking about the stock. You don't reduce it overnight. It is going to take time. And, and you do not want to completely rock a banking system in any particular country. And I'm not only thinking uh, of one versus others. So if, you know, and I'm describing the ideal scenario. Uh, if within the next, I don't know, let's say six months or so, there could be a, a meeting of the minds. I'm not talking about the actual uh, description of the precise delivery, but the meeting of the minds, the general principles, and the timeline associated with the delivery of the ultimate objective could be agreed. And then the sequencing over whatever it takes, to, to quote Mario, if it's a matter of five years, so be it but that the commitment be made, be known, and that it be public, that members of the currency union actually stick together and are going to deliver on those various items. Uh, if you take the, the, uh, the banking union, which in a way is the one on which there seems to be um, more uh, beginning of a consensus, it would require what I, what I call the consideration. On the one hand, banks need to continue their uh, reform process and uh, compliance with Basel three and a half, as they should, plus they agree to uh, reduce and provision properly or write off uh, their non-performing loans under the supervision of the SSM uh, at, the, at the euro area level. And at the same time, <coughs> the uh, common uh, deposit insurance uh, scheme is put in place gradually over time. <coughs> Excuse me and the common, the common fiscal backstop with the link to the ESM is established. And I think it, sh it, sh it shouldn't be impossible to actually stage that in that respect. You know, with, with the, the, the fiscal capacity, it, what's important is actually 
the first step and the design of the institution. Now, first step can be this political com commitment. Design of, the, of the, the way the fund works will take time and haggling and, 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 and negotiations and all the rest of it. But it's that step which is needed. And then the funding will come, you know, bit by bit. And as the funding grows in that fund, then clearly the performance of the member states can be tested. And the carrot and the stick that I have, descri that I have described can actually operate hopefully. Um, one thing that I have not mentioned, which we believe in strongly, is that the growth and stability pact, whether it's the preventive or the corrective arm of it and all its delicacies, is, in our view, a little bit too complicated. Um, you know, you probably have two dozens of people who actually master the whole thing in all its technicalities and critical details, or maybe two dozens. But it can be a little bit simpler than that. We made proposal in 2015. I think we stick to those proposals of, of streamlining, having a, a strong debt anchor and, and a, a spending commitment uh, method, which does not require as much um, excruciating uh, technical details and which would be much easier to communicate so that public opinion, people would understand why it is uh, that those two measures are, are, are useful. Maybe picking up on that last point, uh, you indeed you didn't talk much about the, the fiscal rules, which a lot of people argue could or should be a fourth element. And uh, um, particular during the height of the, the financial crisis in Europe, there was a lot of criticism towards Germany for imposing austerity politics or austerity policies being too restrictive on, on fiscal policies. And, and of course, in Germany, the concern was that countries were too expansionary, but not were not. Uh, um, restrictive enough. Um, now, the stability and growth pact that you mentioned is, um, requires a spending that is not particularly counter-cyclical, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so there are proposals. Are you saying, are you happy with the stability and growth pact? But if you say, what should it be complemented by? You, you think these rules can work or does it need something in addition? Uh, you know, if, it, if it's too complicated to change too many things at the same time, it, you know, it, it's been elaborated over the course of the last 10 years of more. Let's not make it more, and we're not proposing to make it more, complement, more complicated by complementing it with yet something else. We're proposing to actually replace the current complication, uh, complicated scheme with something that is more simple and more easily communicable to public opinion so that there is ownership of it. That, that's what we're proposing. We, we are going to publish actually soon uh, a, a special paper on um, the fiscal rule and not, a, not with the euro area in mind only because there are lots of other currency areas and other countries that have actually adopted uh, the fiscal rule. Okay. Um, I, I have a very hard time asking you critical questions because I agree with most of it, so I, I need to play a bit the devil's advocate <laughs> if you allow me. Um, you meant, mentioned deposit insurance um, as one important element, uh, European deposit insurance. And the concern a lot of people have in Germany is that this is just a hidden transfer union, creating a hidden transfer union. Because some countries, as you rightly described in your speech, has banks that are more risky, have a higher share of NPLs, of non-performing loans. So if you have a common deposit insurance scheme, it essentially means the safer countries, or countries with safer banks, are implicitly subsidizing uh, countries with more risky banks. Um, how would you respond to that criticism? Well, first of all, I would observe that in our proposal, it is the banks that are actually shouldering uh, the, the insurance effort. Uh, and, and I think it's an important point that the taxpayer be, that the depositors be partially covered up to a certain threshold, as we know, uh, but that the banks be actually on the hook for that. Um, so that's one. Two, we recognize this issue, that some banks have done great efforts in the last 10 years, not only to increase capital, not only to have a better uh, absorbing loss capacity, but also who, you know, who have essentially cleaned up their balance sheets and, and provisioned or written off those non-performing loans, which has itself accelerated the process by which companies had to restructure, be reorganized, or completely um, had to disappear. That process has to take place as well in other countries. And it, not only for the sake of this, um, this beautiful construction that we're proposing, but because if the banks actually have this sanity check, their balance sheet will look better. But 
they will also be in a position to actually give credit and provide loans to other viable enterprises in their country. And by the same token, those zombie firms which are you know, under, under, under life support because the loans have not been written off, because the foreclosure procedures or because the attachment procedures have not been taken up by the banks which prefer not to look at it, those zombie firms would have to be, uh, to be reorganized. And that would be just healthier for the economy. So more credit to those new enterprises or viable enterprises and old already half dead enterprises uh, reorganized. And the, and the whole insurance deposit workable. Mm -hmm. I want to come to, to one of the core points you made on the central fiscal capacity, and you, you mentioned that you published this paper today, this morning at 10, 10 o'clock, um, which proposes central fiscal capacity, uh, or rainy day fund, as you call it, is 0.35% uh, pay-in of, of GDP, every country paying in. Um, now, another, in, in addition to um, to transfer union, another red flag in Germany is the issue of moral hazard. Um, and um, the big question or the big concern, of course, is if we created such a rainy day fund, such a fiscal capacity, um, who ensures that countries don't, or governments don't say, thank you very much, now we have additional insurance. So we actually don't need to provide self-insurance in the sense that we can spend now more money because if there is a crisis... No, they do. They do because if, if they did not, they would not have access to the fund. And is that a credible and threat? <sighs> you know, if, if, if a member is deliberately cheating, not complying with the rules, uh, wanting to live at the expense of others, uh, there is an issue with that member and it needs to be sorted out by friends and colleagues and peers around the table. Uh, you, you, you know, when you join the club, you play by the rules. You've signed up on the rules. And, and the, the fund is intended to that effect. Why? Two reasons. One is, you are only eligible to receive if you have behaved in the past. So that's incentive number one. Incentive number two, if you have to receive from the fund, you're going to pay back and a premium on it. So it's a double incentive and both work, carrot and stick at the same time. So I think, you know, to the extent that the, the fund is so um, efficient based on our modelization and, and we've really tested the model as, as much and as, you know, as well as we could, but it's, it's quite an impressive uh, performance if you contribute point 35% of GDP, it accumulates over time, and when the crisis hits, you reduce the impact by 50%. It's pretty, uh, pretty encouraging uh, as, an, you know, as an insurance coverage, essentially. So, with those two carrot and stick, a country should, should, should be incentivized to actually follow the rules. I believe, by the way, that um, Eurostat has made enough progress, I hope it continues to do so, to verify that numbers, statistics, um, data are collected, analyzed and shared um, with, with, a, you know, with a degree of accuracy uh, which, uh, which is satisfactory for you know, proper communication between the members. I mean, one, one issue, of course, people... But again, <laughs> you, you know, the initial point that you made earlier about timing, we have observed, uh, and we've published on that as well, that up until the euro area accession, countries converged, really made efforts to improve productivity, to, uh, um, you know, to raise their uh, income per capita. And as soon as they join the euro area, we see that progress actually stalls a bit. We need to re, um, rejuvenate that determination to to move together forward. Um, and I would hope that this fund is, is mm -hmm. contributing to it. I mean, a, a bit of um, frustration in Germany is that um, when we created the, the, the Euro and the EMU, um, there, was, there were certain commitments, several commitments that were not kept. And one of them, one important one of them, was the no bailout. So the credible commitment, if a government gets into difficulty, 
the other governments are not going to help. And we know um, this commitment was not credible because partly also because of contagion. And if you look even at the Greece bailout in 2010, um, everyone had in mind Lehman Brothers less than two years before and said, oh, if Lehman Brothers can bring an entire financial system uh, into crisis, uh, maybe Greece could have could bring the entire euro area into crisis. And then instead of having a bail-in, so no bailouts, so private creditors, in particular German banks and French banks, uh, contributing um, to a haircut, uh, basically taxpayers stepped in because mm. of that worry. So there's no bailout that was an important element of monetary union was ultimately not credible because, you know, we are so integrated. And so, of course, that's, that's one concern is making uh, certain help or certain support conditional on sticking to the rules and certain elements, of course. But you see, Marcel, mm -hmm. when I, I mean, as you speak, I'm reflecting uh, on years back because I was, I was in that room um, and I was first as finance minister and then as managing director of the IMF. And I think it was, again, an issue of timing because for a period of time, uh, as soon as we began hearing about escalating deficit numbers, which were unknown to us. We, we had in mind the no bailout, and we thought, oh, well, you know, this is only X percent of total euro area GDP, and it's not a big exposure, and it would not require so much additional financing, so that, that can be sorted out, and the no bailout clause will be respected, so we don't help out. No, no moral hazard there and one euro group after the other, and one euro group after the other. It was the same ceremony. But if we had, in due course, said, whoops, systemic risk potential, um, mechanism in place, the unemployment rate in Greece is going up, additional criteria are triggered, not, I mean, it wouldn't be the members stepping in to bail out. It would be the fund to which the country would have access hopefully because it has complied with, with, with the objectives of the uh, um, Stability and Growth Pact. So hopefully it would have, the mechanism would have been triggered much earlier than what we did, which again was hampered by all sorts of preventions from the no bailout to the no debt restructuring to uh, the no IMF intervention. And you know, we, we, we all had the same um, Reticence, but I think we should learn from what happened in those days. Coming to, to another dimension, uh, the dimension of monetary policy. I mean, you rightly said the, the ECB has been under a lot of pressure to uh, basically be the only reliable institution within the euro area to act quickly and decisively to stem, as you described, the 2012 episode of the ECB and the promise, whatever, whatever it takes. Um, the London Olympic Games. Yes, end of that, July. That's, that's, what, that's when he said it. <laughs> yes, end of July 2012. Um, would your proposals on banking union, capital market union, uh, fiscal, central fiscal capacity make life easier for the ECB? How do you see the role of the ECB in the interaction with these elements? Well, I think by, by their own account, um, they would agree that it's made easier. Uh, we've heard many times over, particularly in, in the euro area, but in other places as well, central bankers uh, complain uh, that they are the only game in town, uh, that uh, fiscal policy should come to, to rescue uh, the, the zone or the countries, and uh, that they, they, cannot, they cannot possibly deal with it by themselves. In many ways they did. Um, and my suspicion is that they would welcome certainly the um, capital market union, certainly the union, the, the banking union, and they would probably recognise because they are also attentive to political, the political dilemmas and dimensions of the debate. They would also say that central fiscal capacity would be nice to have, but if 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 not, then having the other two um, would be good. Um, but if there was a central fiscal capacity, I'm sure that they would be quite pleased because it would. Um, uh, they wouldn't be the, the only game in town. And uh, markets, investors, uh, observers would know that there is a, a collective determination to actually deal with moments of crisis and deal with moments of crisis early enough before it has time to escalate and to, and to contaminate the rest of the countries. I think that's the beauty of this, of this proposal. 
so that you can actually measure on a per country basis and, and give access. Mm -hmm. A lot of the issues that we dealt with during the post um, country and then euro sovereign debt crisis had to do with timing because institutions were not ready, mechanisms could not be triggered, conditionalities were not in place and we were just racing against the clock of the crisis that was getting us closer and closer to the abyss. I have two, two final questions. One is concerning the role of the IMF, which of course was hotly debated over the last seven, eight years. And the German government made some of the Greece programs conditional on IMF being involved because this idea there's only one institution that has really the credibility, the experience to do so. Um, but of course for the IMF, uh, the, the role has changed. I mean, if you think about 10, 20 years ago, where a lot of crises were more current accounts type of crisis, so external imbalances, now we have financial stability, financial imbalances have become a lot more important. Um, maybe you can say a bit, a few words on, on the IMF. I mean, if you, they were in the early 2000s, there was this idea of an SDIM, a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, so that the IMF also could play a role there. What's your vision for the IMF for the next years? Uh, where will it move to, to provide those services others cannot? Hmm. Well, first of all, we would continue to provide the, the sort of the surveillance um, uh, work that we do with every country in the institution. You know, the 189 member countries benefit from this surveillance policy, the surveillance of their economic policies and our recommendations in terms of, of, uh, of policies. Um, so we would continue doing that because it's part of the, the founding um, establishment of the institution with its, with its members. And, uh, you know, we do that on, on a <clears throat> per country basis. We also do a euro area uh, policy review and we do an FSAP, which is the financial sector assessment um, uh, review that we conduct every five years. We're doing one at the moment in the euro area. So that, I think, you know, we don't see any reason why that would change. I think on the sovereign debt restructuring, we have come a long way because, I mean, you follow what we do, so you, you know that, but for those not necessarily following us, at the time of the Greek crisis, a systemic exemption mechanism was put in place in order to um, give Greece exceptional access to a lot of financial support. And that um, systemic exemption mechanism was, was criticized so, you know, we took note of that and uh, we revisited that. And essentially what we, we did is anchor the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism around a, a, a good debt sustainability analysis, which we always do anyway when, we, when a country is in trouble and asks for our help. And <clears throat> that debt sustainability analysis generally gives a series of options. One is that is absolutely not sustainable, and in that case, we recommend a debt restructuring as part of the, of the, of the process. Or the country is actually in, in a good position and has a liquidity issue, in which case other financial instrument must be made available, but no debt restructuring is absolutely needed. And then, as always, you have the sort of gray area in between. And for that, um, we, we now have a range of options where debt restructuring is not necessarily uh, the mechanism that will be applied, but other options are also made available. So I think we have, we have our house in order in terms of what tools we can make available. Um, we, I don't think we are the expert in town, but we are one of the very few experts in town to provide the most independent debt sustainability analysis. There's one thing about the debt sustainability analysis produced by the IMF is that generally we tend or we are alleged to be a tad conservative in our assessments and in our hypotheticals. I have to say that when you go back and you look at what growth assumptions we've made, what various assumptions, generally we've been very close to what has actually happened. Uh, not always. There have been instances where we were a little bit more conservative, uh, but the beauty of this institution, in addition to totally committed and competent staff, is that we are independent. So we do not, um, we do not depend on the, the, the latest phone calls by anyone. We, we just have to um, 
follow the, the principles that we have always adhered to ever since the institution was created. And sometimes we are the messenger of the inconvenient truth. Um, and we have to be the, the ruthless truth teller, as Keynes would have said in his own time. Uh, so my suspicion is that we will continue to provide those services. To what extent we do it with the Euro area or with Euro area members is something that is left for the member countries to decide. And I guess that the, as the ESM builds up its, its crisis management capacity and its ability to help with financing, our respective role will evolve over time. And my guess is that as we are cooperating with other regional financing um, authorities, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in the Arab world, we will also refine our cooperation with the, the ESM. But, and, and with the Commission, because clearly the ESM and the Commission are going to be two games in town, and, and we'll have to understand what each of the two does. As a final question, coming back to, to the beginning, to the timing issue, and uh, Christine, if you had a, we have a new German government, brand new, we will probably, hopefully have soon a new Italian government. Um, yeah. Um, there is a, um, um, a rare window of opportunity uh, this year before next year the European elections start. If you had a wish on reforming the Euro area architecture to the new German government, to the other European governments, what would be your key message you would provide them with? You know, I would stick to my meetings. I would say, um, first of all, the, the apparent meeting of the minds at your level, make sure that it trickles down the organizations of your respective administrations so that the technical experts who follow the guidance of their boss actually have the same determination to agree. One. Two, focus on a sequence of deliverables and make sure that you communicate to your public opinion, not in those highly sophisticated economic terms that you understand, that I try to understand, that you all understand, I'm sure, but in terms that are easy to understand from their perspective. In other words, somebody who is sitting here, there, or elsewhere in Europe, what will it give him or her if that is agreeable? How will it protect its savings, its deposit? How will it actually give you know, a, a, a lasting growth and long-term jobs in that region? That's what needs to be communicated. Now, I don't want to go beyond my area of competence as managing director of the IMF, so I'll limit my wish list to that. But I would, as a third component, add the sequencing that I've, we, we discussed earlier on. Give the arrival point, agree on the general principle, give a timeline, and deliver sequence by sequence by sequence, so that there is a sense of progress and, and some optimism that is so badly needed. You know, I'm, I'm super privileged that you know, I can see what's happening elsewhere in the world. Uh, and optimism, an area where people can actually have a dialogue, disagree, agree on some, move on, deliver, re-agree, re-disagree, agree, again, move, That's, that is vital. This was, a, I think, a very fitting last words. So thank you very much, Christine. And uh, please join me in thanking Christine Lagarde for a fascinating talk. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>